Thank you all for coming. Uh, my talk is about democratizing XR, and I'm going to talk about uh, the work that my students and I do. 3D scan of myself, I do that with my students. I'm a digital journalism professor. You know, journalism is not something you would think about when we think about immersive, uh, but I focus on emerging technologies that are different from the printing press, which a lot of my colleagues may be, you know, defined by. Uh, for us, we're looking at different types of printing presses that are coming out every month, if not every week, and trying to test out whether or not these might be the disruptions we've been looking for to change how we create these stories to stay relevant to our communities and inform our diverse communities. Um, my job is to look at these technologies and try to figure out how might we use this for journalism, for nonfiction storytelling. Uh, a couple years ago, 2017, I was part of an ethnographic study with Google, and they looked at immersive, and they talked about the shift from storytelling to story living. I want to kind of talk about this concept, because two years later, at Oculus Connect, they talked about that, story living to story, uh, storytelling to story living. There's some audio with this. She's talking about Vader Immortal, and how there is a shift from storytelling to story living, right? I was in the audience and I was like, oh my God, the they quoted our story quote. Storytelling to story living. <laughs> Perfect timing, um, right? The shift from storytelling to story living. But there's something that's a challenge with our industry, which is most of the storytelling, AKA story living, are first person shooters, which are phenomenal. But that seems to be our biggest note to tell. Medal of Honor was announced at that conference, and this is a teaser video that they played, but originally I'm gonna show you something that they changed afterwards. Also has audio. Can someone start the timer so I can see my guy? Now, it's awesome, it's hilarious, it's very cool. Medal of Honor is one of the best games ever. It's a first person shooter. Who can disagree with fighting Nazis, right? Kill the Nazis. But in the original uh, trailer, that wasn't a pan that they threw, it was a knife. Now think about that in VR space. What are you gonna do with that knife? You're gonna sneak up to a Nazi and slit his throat. That's pretty graphic, again, I'm not clutching my pearls because I'm a conservative against video games or this stuff, but it's something that we often do in this space. Uh, earlier this year, was it? Uh, yeah, March of this year, this tweet went out. This incredible independent developer shared this physics that he has done. It's amazing, but it's also extremely graphic. He even said he worried about it a little, about how graphic it is. It is amazing, that is difficult to do, but is this what we want to do with this new skill set, right? And so I tweeted a response that said, this is the future of VR if we don't bring in more diverse creators. Let me tell you, the industry got pissed and yelled at me and cussed me out and said, you're an outdated professor, you bet you've never done any immersive stuff, whatever, I've been trolled before. So I responded and reminded them, like, let's not kid ourselves. You know, killing zombies, killing Nazis, red-shaped people like those other games, there's, those are the most dominant experiences in our space, right? What that developer did was amazing, but imagine if he channeled that expertise, that talent in different types of experiences. We need diverse creators. Everyone thought I was some woke person, uh, maybe because my last name ended with the Z, Hernandez, Latino. Uh, that they assumed that I was talking about people of color and women, women of color. Coincidentally, those diverse perspectives bring alternative views, but that's not what I meant. I meant that we need to create a lot more than just first-person shooters or any type of violent-based video games. Our industry is gonna change every aspect of our lives. If the metaverse were to come true, it's gonna be a lot more inclusive than Fortnite, right? Which is not the metaverse. Uh, Again, for those who are attacking me, those were the things that they focused on, right? Diverse creators means we need to create more things, right? And again, through the prism of journalism, what does that mean? 
I get to work with some amazing students, and we produce under the name Javernalism, right? That's the, we pronounce it, a little typo, the U, and we changed it to a V. See what we did there? It's trademark. Uh, and we get to create incredible experiences. We've worked with a variety of media companies from USA Today, the New York Times, Al Jazeera, AJ Plus, museums. We work with these traditional media companies to create these experiences. We work with tech companies. Many tech companies I partnered up with through AWE and other conferences. This is like my 12th AWE that I've been at. Um, and we get to collaborate, and a lot of people donate uh, equipment to us software, support in a variety of ways, and we produce experiences, nonfiction experiences that win awards. When we've won two Webby Awards, a Shorty Award, all these different types of awards to showcase that there's a lot more than immersive storytelling than murdering something or being in a first person shoot 'em up game or whatever experience that we are generally routinely coming up with. One piece was about climate change, about the Salton Sea, which is a, the largest lake in California, which is dying. Uh, we talked about the science of the sea and why there's fish die-offs, or how kids are getting asthma because the playa is being exposed, or how the indigenous community that was there before the lake is there during the lake, and the indigenous community is going to be there after the lake is gone. How are they coping with that, right? We did a piece on deportation. We here in the States hear about people being deported. What does that mean in their reality when they're kicked out of the country and they land into another? We put our 360 cameras uh, right at the turnstiles when the US is behind you and Mexico's in front of you. What awaits you? We profiled people who've been deported, who've been separated from their families, a pastor who was deported, but his American citizen families deported with him to open up a church. American veterans that served in the military that were later deported, right? Humanizing this kind of perspective. But we've done it in traditional journalism, meaning traditional journalism is the reporter goes, parachutes into a community, gathers the information, leaves, and go tells their story. My students and I, we do something that I call a community collaborative journalism project where instead of us parachuting in, we partner up with communities, underserved, underrepresented communities, like the housing and secure in Los Angeles. I managed to kind of save some money, buy 360 uh, cameras, the Gear 360 cameras, and come up with kits that I use to train members of the homeless community and then let them have those equipment. So we asked them, we showed them what this technology can do, and then we said, what story do you want to tell? Don't let us decide. You tell us what you want, to, want the world to know, and we will help you tell it. And so we created a variety of different stories, including one of my favorites is Tim and Daisy. They were a couple. They had been dating for four months, and they wanted to talk about what it's like to fall in love while homeless. How do you foster intimacy in a relationship when your life is so public on the street? That is a story that no journalist would have thought of, but this community wanted to express. Lots of different stories. Um, we also used at that time, uh, this is 2018 Snapchat Lens Studio, we hijacked that platform, not to make you know, uh, filters for our faces, but we did photogrammetry of homeless dwellings and, uh, and other items that was important to them, uh, brought them into Snapchat, and made AR experiences. Here's a screen capture of uh, Jennifer's tent. She was homeless in Echo Park. She's in transitional housing, last we heard Hi, a my year name ago. is Jennifer. I'm going to show this you how This is an augmented reality, audio-driven, um, interactive infographic where you can click so on the blue dots for a hotspot to do a virtual tour. That but what's really cool charger. Uh, is that we uh, use this model as a portal where you phones. can crouch There's down no outlet, and step uh, inside and attempt. hold presence you with their home. This aspect decodes uh, what it's Starbucks, like to survive on the street. And let me tell you, I could not do it. Out. This gave me a better understanding on how people survive. This is a community that we in Los Angeles and pretty much anywhere in this country are trained to not make eye contact with. But we use this shiny technology to get you to look to get you to engage and get you to see them differently. That uh, led to a bunch of projects. We won Best Journalism Piece of the Year by the Society of Professional Journalists. Out of all the journalism created by students that year, I was the, ours was the best of the best. So I'm a proud papa, proud professor papa, papa professor. Uh, we've then worked with um, youth and foster care. Again, uh, getting camera equipment, beg, borrow, never steal. 
uh, get equipment, put it in the hands of communities that are often left out of these great innovative moments and ask them, what story do you want to tell? Trained them, gave them the cameras, they keep the cameras. We did this piece, as we talked to them, we found out that uh, when you're separated from your parent, you get a teddy bear. And for some in the older generation, that teddy bear is a positive thing, something that helped them stay innocent as they were going through the foster care system. But for a younger generation, we found that the teddy bear is a symbol of the moment you were taken away from your parents, a traumatic moment. So they hate the teddy bear, and we heard that there's a part, we couldn't find it, but there's a part in the court uh, spot where kids toss their teddy bears onto the roof. We couldn't find it, sadly. But what we did was we did a photogrammetry. Um, I don't remember, I think we may have used the HP Z cam, uh, 3D's uh, thing to capture Jenny's teddy bear. And again, using Snapchat, working within the four megabytes, four megabyte limit, uh, created this interactive AR piece. This isn't, we're not, I'm at a private university. You may have heard them in the news that it's so great that people are trying to bribe their way in there. I'm not getting Aunt Becky money trickling down to me. It's me and my students trying to work within our very limited resources and figure out how might we use this technology in ways that our industry, the immersive industry, and the journalism industry are not thinking about. So we're prototyping it and making it up and inventing these pieces together. Uh, even during COVID, we did this remotely. I taught and trained uh, survivors of domestic abuse uh, over Zoom, shipped them cameras. They shared their stories with us. And in this particular case, they filmed all the pieces themselves as best they could. And then we edited the pieces to, to capture what it's like uh, two years out, five years out, 20 years out from an abusive relationship, how these women keep moving forward and surviving and thriving. This semester, we are working with uh, Words Uncaged. These are folks that are formerly incarcerated, back into reentry, how they're adapting into society. Uh, my students are deep in production with that now. Um, students who are working with someone who was released five months ago. Uh, how is he dealing with it, right? And these are not like light crimes. They're pretty significant crimes uh, that were charged against them. Some were sent to life in prison when they were juveniles, but then uh, because they were juveniles, they were, their sentencing was, uh, sentencing was re-examined. And again, these are not voices that we often think about when we think about immersive storytelling. And here, we already met with them, gave them the cameras, trained them, and are now working with them to tell those stories, those perspectives that are often left out. This is us at USC when we, uh, day two or, uh, of the training, where after they got onboarded on the technology and were wowed, we then turned the tables and said, what's the story that you want to tell, right? So Jenea, Tobias, Nacho, Sam, all telling the students, this is what I imagine my story to be. And that's what we're working on right now. We need you. We need the industry. We need a bunch of folks to not forget these perspectives that sure may not be VC, uh, uh, VCs to invest in our technology, but if we want a metaverse that is inclusive, the utopia that the internet was supposed to be, we need all of these perspectives to be included, and you all play an important part of it. This conference plays an important part of it. Like I said, I made uh, partnerships, and I think the last uh, time I spoke, I put into the universe, hey, Samsung or anyone with Samsung, I'm paying out of pocket for cameras. You should be donating me cameras. Lo and behold, someone in the audience connected me with someone, and someone at Samsung was like, we're trying to get rid of these cameras. They shipped them to me. As you know, they're no longer in the space. They sh I opened the box and they came out. Holy shit. So this is the stuff I'm fortunate to partner with Insta360. They've been really great partners. Reality Capture, Capturing Reality, um, Mystica VR, they've all been supportive. And uh, I hope that folks can join us in that. Because if not, you remember this meme when Facebook acquired Oculus? This is what the future will be if we don't be proactive and shape it how we want it to be. My God, it's full of ads. So thank you for your time. Uh, we produce under the name Journalism a variety of different ways to engage with our content. 
Uh, we have about six minutes of questions. I went super fast to hit this time slot, so thank you. Yeah, if anybody has, thank you very much. If anybody has any questions, I'll please come up to this uh, microphone right here. Just line up. Thank you. Hey, Robert, great presentation. I'm actually following you, and I'm going to do similar stuff, so I'd love for you to stay. But my question is, the homeless encampment that you shot, what camera yeah. did you use for that? So um, we did a mixture of, for 360, we, did, we gave out the Samsung Gear 2017, and we used Fusion and the Z camera for the stories. But for the photogrammetry, um, that was our first model we ever did. Um, we used a DSLR camera. But we've done more photogrammetry since, and an iPhone camera is just fine. And there's so many, the technology has changed. If you have an iPhone, check out the app uh, Poly, Polycam. Uh, that, that has LiDAR. LiDAR has not been great in my experience, usually really expensive technology too. But Polycam does photogrammetry free, very affordable, so it's changed the game. And like I mentioned, the HP, uh, HP helped us out, shipped us one of these demo units that we ended up buying. $500 camera that you hook up to your monitor. You literally rotate the item underneath. It edits out your fingers and optimizes a 3D model for you. And this, when you went into the, the tent, was that just with a regular camera? That was shooting? a 360 photo, right? So think oh, about so you just it. capture the photo and then you, well, how did you make it spatial where I could walk into that? So photogrammetry to make a 3D model. Yeah. Optimize the hell out of it because normally those are gigs. Yeah. And the whole thing had to be under four megabytes. Yeah. Go Snapchat the idea, and they're like, Professor, we love it. It's never going to work. Uh, but my students didn't give up. We optimized the hell out of it, and we took a 360 photo. Originally, we wanted to do a 360 video, but we just couldn't really do it. Hold presence with Jennifer in her space. We couldn't pull it off. We actually did one with Angie in the car, a little pixelated. But with the tent, we opted with a photo. And it's, really, it's actually really simple. There's the model. There it is. You take the sphere. You put it inside the model, and so instead of going into an empty model, you're sticking your head into sure. a spherical photo. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. That was great. Awesome. I think what you're doing is amazing. Um, I was wondering what you think, from your perspective, we need to do differently this time around to make sure that this, these kinds of people have access to the technology and can share their stories uh, differently from the Internet of today. There's like a million touch points to answer that question. One that I've seen as I've been in this space at this conference, see the demographic shift, but I've also seen the rewriting of history that often excludes women. Uh, someone sent me the book of the definitive history of VR. Uh, they excluded Nani de la Pena. How the hell do you not include Nani into that space, whether you agree or a fan or not a fan? I've been trained by women. Uh, um, Christina Heller, who's the CEO of Metastages, she taught me how to stitch the 360 video for the first time. She onboarded me into this space. So one, we can't rewrite history just because someone discovered it. Some dude discovered that, hey, meta sounds like something I want to get in on. There's been a lot of people working in this space. Way, uh, I'm writing the coattails of many of you and those who've been here for decades. Don't rewrite history. Don't exclude those voices. And when you hire people, just the nature of hiring them and putting them in the room will change the conversations and perspectives, right? That's a huge act. Sure, you want to hire people that went to your same school, that went through your same background, but you're not going to get diversity in that kind of respect. So really that culture. And two, sometimes it's hard to hire folks um, or, or find them to take a chance to apply for you because they've also been burned in other companies that they may not want to go to a company that's not diverse. So if you're aware of that, proactively recruit, bring in the community, bring in an intern, empower people so they can shape the content and the impact that your work does. Okay. Last one. Um, yes, um, thank you. This was extraordinary, and thank you so much for all the oh, work thank you do. You. Uh, I've long uh, volunteered with foster care, child trafficking survivors, and organizations, so I was curious on one hand, like because that's included a lot of media work to tell survivor stories, uh, I was curious if you partnered with any specific organizations to we do did. that. And also, were there any plans to um, kind of aggregate it out to, to help other cities do something like this? And I was just on a panel with uh, Nani for South by Southwest. Awesome. I'd love that shout out too. Thank cool. you so much. Um, so um, typically, journalistically, we call sources and say, do you want to get on board? 
uh, right? Or we, they lot, let us jump in the room, capture stuff, and then leave. But the point of the community collaboration is to treat each other as equals. Um, so I can invest time to get credibility for the community, but for the homeless, for example, they're tired of the media and they're tired of being treated like animals in the zoo. So we went through nonprofits for each one of those organizations through a nonprofit that understood what we were going for. They may not have fully understood it until they saw our work, um, but they understood our intent on how we were going to train and listen. You can't be exploitative. You can't be voyeuristic. It is, hey, this is your story. I'm here to help. Let me give you some pointers. Let me help. But it's your, you're defining what story you want to tell to the world. And so we've done that, and it's a really collaborative process uh, to, to do each piece. My class, students sign up. I warn them before they register, hey, this class is jazz hands. I'm going to cuss. Uh, my syllabus is bullshit uh, because I don't know what we're going to make because we're meeting members of this community on week four of the 15-week semester. I don't know what we're going to make. They're going to decide that. And so it's a different approach to giving them a lot of power in that. And then in terms of scaling, um, we give the content to the nonprofits. I want them to use it for fundraisers. I'm happy to do pop-ups and demo it in headset um, so they can make some money to build uh, out awareness, right? Journalistically, that's not what we're supposed to do. But again, what is my mission? My mission is to inform my diverse communities, not just the communities that can afford these high-end headsets. Um, I haven't found a way to scale to do it in other cities and things like that, but we're always looking for opportunities to collaborate with companies, tech companies, media companies, nonprofits, underserved, underrepresented communities. So don't hesitate to reach out and see if we can do something. Cool. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Robert.